Um, so thanks for, for folks joining us uh, on, on the Zoom as well. Um, Sky Haas is an avid birder and naturalist who hails from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, where he often works as a contract biologist for organizations like Whitefish Point Bird Observatory, the Nature Conservancy, as well as for wings and eagle eye. His specialty, however, is in conducting water bird migration counts, most recently at the Point Pinos Sea Watch in Monterey, California. Sky was formerly the water bird counter at the Avalon Sea Watch at the Cape May Bird Observatory in New Jersey, where in 2014, he was the lead counter of the team that set the all-time single season record of over 1 million, 26,000 migrating water birds. Sky has a degree in conservation biology from Northern Michigan University and is a returning member of the Michigan Bird Records Committee. Sky is also a member of the board of the Laughing Whitefish Audubon Society, and we are pleased to have him here tonight. You are about to be blown away by his photography and knowledge of birds. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you very much, Jeff. I appreciate that. That's, uh, that's, that's very kind. I, uh, uh, I'm really happy to uh, share my uh, photos and adventures with everyone. Um, I've been, uh, oh, nice turnout. Uh, I've been, uh, like you said, you know, I've been working as a field biologist most of my life. I uh, had gone to school at NMU, although I had actually started working as a, a bird biologist over at Whitefish Point a few years earlier. And uh, uh, as I spent years and years just working in the field, uh, counting birds, uh, you know, every so often people would, uh, you know, get a hold of me and be like, hey, you keep seeing all these, uh, these great birds. Uh, uh, would you be interested in taking me out to go see some? And, uh, you know, it's like I, I did from time to time, but, uh, you know, tour leading was never actually on my agenda. Um, you know, it's like I didn't get into nature and wild things to, to be a socialite, that's for sure. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so in the last uh, few years, I just started getting uh, contacted more and more to uh, lead birding tours. Um, and just as of a couple of years ago, I, you know, just fully embraced it. And uh, after years of doing field and considering going back into academics, I realized that uh, taking people out bird watching and connecting them with nature that I had found my classroom finally. Uh, and, you know, and with that sort of realization, I just, I leaped in and started birding, uh, birding for uh, eagle eyes and uh, wings and uh, doing my little tours here and there. And uh, it's been, uh, it's been a fun, fun jump. And in the last, uh, the last year, I was, I was working full time. I was just all over the North American continent. Uh, gosh, I think I did about 19 states and British Columbia and just, uh, you know, saw a bunch of birds and people, uh, you know, I'd, I'd be walking down some trail in Arizona and somebody would be like, wow, so you're, are you going for the record? And I'd be like, what are you talking about? And they'd say, well, you're, you're, you're running a big year, right? And I was just like, nope, just having one. <laughs> so um, big years. Uh, people have been doing it for a long time. Uh, Roger Tory Peterson in the 1950s, uh, he and this British naturalist, uh, James Fisher, they did this uh, trek across America. And it was more of a, just to see the public land and the wildlife and birds of uh of the United States and Canada. Um, and it was uh, just kind of like this little afterthought at the very end of his book where he made mention that they had seen, uh, yeah, God, I think it was like 520 some species of birds. And, you know, he hadn't set out to start the first big year, but it really, that that's what sparked it all. Um, so then, you know, come later in this late 60s and early 70s, the American Birding Association uh, was uh, created and it was kind of a little more of a, uh, you know, part enjoying of nature and ornithology and part kind of a competition game thing where people were like, well, let's see how many birds we can get. Uh, over the course of the year. Um, and this was like first really made, uh, 
you know, brought to uh, people's attention by uh, Ken Kaufman, uh, who wrote this book, uh, Kingbird Highway, which I, I strongly recommend. It's a good read. Uh, when he was uh, like a 17, 18 year old kid, just he dropped out of high school and hitchhiked across uh, the states trying to uh, get as many birds as he possibly could. Um, uh, eating, eating dry cat food, thumbing with rides with truckers, and he still was able to get almost 600 species of birds that year, which uh, um, now it's just kind of, it's turned into this, this thing where uh, people, you know, it's like almost like a birder rite of passage, I think. Um, you know, it was never quite my thing, just because I, I have to admit, I, I'm really, I'm blown away by the amount of effort that it takes. Uh, you know, I, I've never really had the the steam, the, the, the fire in the belly to do something like this. Um, but uh, after after a while, uh, you know, just had, you know, this last year, you know, I, 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 I used to kind of look down on big years as just being kind of a superficial way of connecting uh, with nature. But now I see it as like this, this perseverance, dedication to one's craft, because, you know, I, I fell into this, this accidental big year, and that was just solely based on traveling and leading tours and a, you know, a couple fun busman holiday vacations. And I can't think of what it would be like to actually do it for real, trying to break a record. I mean, those, those folks who do that, they just... It, amazing. Uh, they've, they've got the stuff. Um, so yeah, so last, uh, you know, last year I was, I was on the road a lot. I, uh, but you know, I, I look, you guys know, I live up in Marquette and so, uh, you know, New Year's day hits and I did what I always do. I go look at gulls. Um, this is a pretty little Iceland gull that, uh, kicked off the, the year. Uh, and again, you know, I wasn't intending to to try to you know break any records. Just just out watching a lot of birds. Uh, hang on one second, folks. I got like a weird little pop up screen here. Oh well. Anyways, carry on. Um, no, one second. I just kind of lock in my view here. Okay, now I can see. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so uh, where was it? Oh, yeah, so, you know, so I spent the, the first couple of weeks of the new year just cooling around, uh, watching uh, watching the local UP birds, snowy owls over in the eastern UP and in Marquette. Um, and it was, it was a pretty good finch winter. Um, you know, there were a lot of, you know, I spent a lot of time going up the Pashiki. It's, you know, I think we're really lucky to have this incredible resource so close to our homes that we can go up and see like these white wing crossbills and uh, pine grosbeak. And here's a male pine grosbeak. Uh, God, I think this bird was I photographed right by Bothwell. Um, but, you know, winter time doesn't have a lot of birds in the UP. So, uh, you know, I've started stacking up a lot of tours in the winter time, so I can get out and actually uh, go look at some some beasts. Uh, and over the last uh, two years, I've been spending a lot of time down in southeast Arizona, which is uh, just a naturalist playground. Uh, it, it's warmer relatively than the UP. Obviously, there's not piles of snow. It does get pretty cold there down at night and up in the mountains, but, but uh, the landscape is uh, diverse enough that there's a wide array of birds that winter down there or are just year-round residents. Um, you know, you pull into Tucson and you start birding around those saguaros and you just start getting all these awesome desert birds like Roadrunner and Cactus Wren and uh, Faina Pepla which is uh, part of the silky flycatcher family. You can see it's as a uh, well-named bird, very silky looking. Uh, Costa's hummingbirds are year-round residents down there. And uh, as are violet-crowned hummingbirds, although they are a bit more common in the summer than they are in the winter. Uh, one of the big things that I focus in when I'm leading a tour down in uh, Arizona in the winter is the sparrows. The, you know, everybody loves sparrows, right? Um, they get 
you know, a dozen to 15 species of sparrow meandering about from the, the thorn scrubs and the grasslands, like this uh, black-throated sparrow, this uh, lark sparrow uh, in a little hackberry. You can see the little out-of-focus hackberries. Uh, Green-tailed towhees are, are pretty common. You hear them a lot more than you see them. They've got this cute little meow that they're always doing down in the underbrush. And uh, in the wintertime, there's lots of juncos. Uh, you know, the junco diversity down there is just amazing. You can get these, like this pink-sided junco, there's gray-headed juncos, Oregon juncos. And uh, this guy, the yellow-eyed junco, which is uh, a specialty bird of uh, Southeast Arizona, Northern Mexico. Uh, it's part of the draw for me for Arizona is that they're in the uh, Sky Islands. It's a little series of small mountains that are actually kind of the northern end of the Sierra Madres of Mexico. And it uh, just because it, it allows for all these great birds that are normally considered to be Mexican in origin and uh, the, the ecology of these mountains. And they just happen to just spill right over the border. So we get to see a lot of these interesting birds that otherwise would not be in the United States anywhere else. Uh, some winters, there's, you know, it, it's like all, like all winters, as you guys know from, uh, you know, your own bird feeders in Marquette, you know, uh, it's about food resources. That's why birds migrate. And in a, a land like Arizona, even though it's not covered in snow, some years there are food resources for the birds to utilize and other years there's nothing. So it depends on usually what kind of late summer rains they had the previous uh, warm period, whether or not there's a lot of seeds and, and uh, insects for birds like at this lazuli bunting to forage on. So some winters, uh, lazuli buntings and uh, Lawrence's goldfinches can't be found at all down there. And, and other winters, like last winter, they were just everywhere. I uh, was pretty taken with the, the Lawrence's goldfinches, uh, the, you know, I had seen handfuls of them over the years, mostly over in California, but this last winter, there were just, there just massive flocks of them roaming the landscape. It was, it was uh, re real enjoyable. People, I uh, had a few tour groups. There's a uh, one, one wonderful woman, she brought her whole birding club from Missouri on a tour, and this was like their number one draw. So, and, you know, they didn't really know about the eruptive quality of these birds, too. So they had just signed up hoping that they would be there, and they got lucky because we saw them by the bucketfuls. Um, you know, so I was talking about the, the Sierra Madre Islands and these Sky Island uh, mountains. And you know, winter time it gets cold up in up in the mountains. The the a lot of the sycamores and maples they lose their leaves. The oaks will keep their leaves. And but you know, it's 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 pretty cold in those canyons. Uh, some birds do stay year round though, like the Mexican jays, and uh, the, a lot of sapsuckers move down from further up in the Rockies into along the border mountains, such as this Williamson sapsucker. A lot of uh, Red nape sapsuckers, occasionally even our yellow bellied sapsuckers will head over there. And then there's uh, this one, uh, Arizona woodpecker, which is a really cool year round resident, uh, another one of these uh, North Mexican specialty birds. And uh, there's a small flock of uh, tit mice and wintering warblers that you're roaming around. And, you know, again, this is an eruptive thing where some years they're more common than others. And some years they have more warblers with the tit mice flocks, like this uh, black throated gray and this Townsend's warbler. Um, and, you know, it's, it's like I said, you know, it gets kind of cold in the winter. So sometimes uh, a good way to start out your, your morning of birding is uh, to just go to somebody's feeders. This is just a, some, uh, this nice couple I know who live in a portal. They, they are very open about having bird watchers come to their home and look at their birds. And, uh, you know, it's a good way to start on a chilly morning watching the, the Townsend's warblers eat the, the peanut butter. Uh, Castlin's kingbird. Is another bird that usually takes off for the winter, but uh, in the little town of Patagonia, they they seem to have a little enclave where they'll sit here and feed on the berries all winter long. And uh, for being a bird that normally catches insects all winter or all summer long, it's uh, kind of a, a real advantage for them to have these all these non-native ornamental trees to feed on the way the the pine grosbeaks and bohemian waxwings do in our neck of the woods. 
Uh, some some cool rarities that can be found in the winter there uh, include this uh, ruddy ground dove. There is a little, uh, primarily a Central American Mexican species. They uh, periodically come over the border, set up little colonies, blink back out, we're gone for a couple of years, then start over again. And uh, this last year, there seemed to have been a nice little passel of them running around. And the same goes for rose-throated Picard. Uh, this is another one that uh, some years, you know, some, even like they can go a decade without having a major nesting event, and then they'll uh, pop back up in Arizona. Uh, so yeah, so I, you know, busy, busy guy last year, I ran a couple of tours in Arizona, and then from there went straight on to uh, South Texas, to the Rio Grande River. Uh, you can tell there's kind of a theme of me spending a lot of time in the winter along. It's about as far south as I can get in the U.S. and uh, still, uh, you know, keep a job. <laughs> um, so this is uh, Santa Ana, the Spanish moss laden trails of Santa Ana. Um, and so I flew in from Arizona after a couple of weeks of touring to uh, the vet, to uh, Texas, and there were a couple of really just dynamite rarities that last winter in Texas. And you know, when I'm when I'm leading a tour, you know, you have to uh, you have to cater to what your your participants want, and uh, not you know not everybody's into rare birds, and that's perfectly fine. I. Uh, I would never want to uh, drag people to see some rare nondescript thing that they had never heard before when they just, you know, want to see, you know, they've gone down to photograph uh, green jays or something. Now, that being said, I wanted to go see these birds. So I did this, I had like about yeah, 12 hours to do this whirlwind uh, chase where I drove down for the U.S.'s uh, first bat falcon showed up at Santa Ana National Wildlife Refuge last year. And it was a, it was a real hit or miss bird. So I was, I was pretty pleased to uh, have this little window of time to go, go look for it, see it. I had seen it before in Central America and Panama, but uh, it was really neat to be standing at a, a wildlife refuge that I love being at and see this uh, little falcon come in. And uh, there were a couple other good birds. There's uh, this second US record of social flycatcher was hanging out. And this uh, golden crowned warbler, which is uh, another one that's just, you know, really rare to the U.S., only seen in Texas a handful of times. Uh, but, the you know, the regular birds of uh, South Texas are, are amazing. If anybody hasn't gone to the Rio Grande Valley for uh, a getaway in the winter yet, I, I strongly recommend it. It's, it's just, it's stunning. The, the photo ops are amazing. The birds are very comfortable with people for the most part. You know, sadly, the, the habitat's mostly been degraded, but there's some great parks and preserves that uh, still have some great uh, patches for you to go bird watching in. Um, here's another one, Kiskadee. I'm just going to kind of flip through a few slides. I already see I'm talking too much. Got to catch up here. Kiskadee, uh, Altamira Oriole, uh, Buff-Bellied Hummingbirds, a uh, golden-fronted woodpecker, the uh, the southern uh, relative of uh, red-bellied woodpecker. Uh, there's even parakeets and parrots down there. These are green parakeets. Uh, a little bit of a debate whether or not they are native or introduced to the area. Um, old records are a little murky on that subject. Uh, Clay-colored robin. You know, it looks a lot like our robin, other than it just had all its color sucked out. Um, red-billed pigeon this is another pretty common bird in the tropics, but just, just, you know, real isolated little colonies along the Rio Grande River. Uh, groove-billed ani, which is a, a kind of cuckoo from the tropics. They do nest in Texas. Um, you can even see the little grooves along the top of the bill there. They're, uh, they're a crazy bird. They just, they're, they're weak flyers. They just sort of crash through the brush. They uh, so definitely this sort of proto-dinosaur feel to them whenever I'm watching them just clamber through. Uh, they're definitely part of the uh, birds learning how to fly. Um, Rocky, this is uh, related to our whippoorwills and nighthawks. It's always kind of a fun game to go down there and try to see if you can spot these guys roosting uh, on the ground during the day. Oh, 
wrong way. Uh, some cool raptors down there. You got uh, Crested Caracara and Aplomato Falcon, which was uh, uh, extirpated from the U.S. And there's been a uh, pretty pretty successful breeding uh, reintroduction program. There's still you know small numbers of them in Texas, but uh, the the reintroduction program was was success. They're definitely starting to expand up along the Laguna Madre of uh, the Texas coast. Um, which, you know, holds another really endangered bird, hooping cranes. This is kind of like one of the uh, flagstone key species we, uh, we we try to get for our tours. We actually, and we, we do pretty good for them. I think last year we had like about 35, 36 hooping cranes. Uh, we saw them a couple different days down there. We even took a, uh, a boat into Aransas National Wildlife Refuge to see the birds from, uh, you know, in their saltwater marsh habitat. Um, here you can see that they, uh, they all pretty much winter in this narrow band around north of Corpus Christi, Aransas National Wildlife Refuge, where they uh, live primarily off of wolf berries and blue crabs. You can see this guy's, he had just caught a blue crab and is just like flinging it up out of the water. Uh, over his head. Um, it was pretty cool. He actually caught that midair. Um, a lot of other kinds of waders down there, lots of snowy egrets and uh, tricolored herons, which is just one of my most favorite birds. Uh, someone should get a clicker and see how many times I say that through this presentation. <laughs> um, a lot of redheads down there. The, the Laguna Madre uh, holds about 75% uh, of the world's uh, wintering redheads, or at least they used to. I don't know. You know, I, I'm sure maybe some of you folks saw the uh, article floating around about the massive flock of 25,000 uh, redheads that are currently trying to overwinter at the Mackinac Bridge. Um, they've been doing this for about a decade now. And you know, if you're driving across the bridge in December, you'll just sort of see this black smear off towards Mackinac Island, and that's uh, that's all redheads. But uh, yeah, they they uh, traditionally the Laguna Madre of Texas was was their main wintering ground. Uh, a lot of widgeons down there. It's a really cooperative widgeon, uh, and tons of shorebirds. Uh, a lot of black neck stilts. Uh, willets are all over the place. These, uh, this is the prairie nesting willet, uh, uh, the western willet. It's currently willets are considered to be one species, but they're they're two isolated populations: one on the prairies and one on the uh, Gulf Coast that uh, goes to South America for the winter. So all the ones you see in the winter time down there are the the western prairies. I uh, got a little fiddler crab in his chompers. Uh, marbled godwit. <laughs> And long-billed curlew. You can see it's got that cool little bill where the, you know, the, a lot of people don't realize that the bill, the end of that bill is actually really flexible. You know, it can probe deep several inches down into the mud and it'll find some sort of flatworm or something deep buried in the mud. And it can open up the very tip of its bill to cur, you know, curl around and grab that worm to pull it out so it can eat it. Goodness. Um, so yeah, so that was uh, that was a nice run of of tours at that time. I think I was on the road for about 22, 25 days, something like that. And then came home for everybody's favorite month in the UP, March. <laughs> <laughs> Usually that's when every you know everybody's trying to flee, but I, I love March. I love that early spring period where the Northwoods are starting to wake up. Um you know, I headed straight over to Whitefish Point because the uh, the winds were perfect a couple days after I got home from Texas to uh, start watching hawks. There was a nice early season push of hawks. Uh, I went over there with uh, our, our fellow LAWAS member, Gary Palmer, and I, I, I think we had something like 60 some bald, 50, 60 bald eagles. It was actually one of the biggest single day counts of bald eagle ever recorded at Whitefish Point, but it was a, uh, it was a good week before their count season actually started. So, you know, I guess that might be a, uh, yet another sign of climate change and global warming. Um, but yes, we had to like birds like this northern red-tailed hawk, uh, a couple rough-legged hawks were starting to move north. A red-shouldered hawk, which is actually a very early migrant, uh, always surprises me considering they're supposed to eat a lot of reptiles, but they must uh, 
really favor voles early in the season. And uh, golden eagles, that uh, March is a really good time to see adult golden eagles migrating through uh, the Upper Peninsula. Uh, actually, uh, I know some folks from Cape May, they uh, do a lot of transmitter work on golden eagles, catch them down on their wintering grounds in Tennessee and the Smoky Mountains. And I guess, uh, I don't think it was last spring, but two springs ago, we had one of their eagles pass right through Marquette. It uh, took this meandering journey from Kentucky up the west side of Lake Michigan and uh, flew right, uh, what was it, right over Lake Lavasser and headed east to get up to Canada past Whitefish Point. Um, I got home, opened up the house, got my bird feeders going and was promptly hit with 500 red bulls. It was fantastic. Uh, they were just, you know, just carpeted the ground. It was a lot of fun. Had a few hoary red poles in with the, uh, the common red poles. Uh, you know, got up, did some meandering around in the morning, had some, uh, spruce grouse out by Tom Skelding's place out there in Ipamine. He put me on this little colony of them up there in the, the hills by the, uh, Dead River Basin, um, and a couple other of our favorite little boreal species of uh, the you know the west part of Marquette, you know blackback woodpecker, and boreal chickadee, which is the best of birds, really. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, yeah, they uh, just real quick on the boreal chickadees, they uh, they're sadly really declining in Michigan and all the north woods. Uh, so many of our uh, boreal species are on a retreat heading northward. Uh, climate change, habitat loss, it's just, it's all this is one concert kind of working against us. I, you know, I used to spend a lot of time up in the Pashiki where I'd get like 20, 25 uh, pairs of boreal chickadees. And nowadays I, I lucky if I come back with like having seen a couple mm. uh, but uh anyways uh so yeah so I had a few weeks off in, in March and made the most of it but uh you know spring spring comes uh too late up there so I had to get back on the road before long and I headed out to uh Colorado um to uh, lead my uh my tour for wings the uh the what would we call the chicken tour the dancing chicken tour it's uh it's quite the uh adventure where we just we roll around Colorado and Kansas and Nebraska uh looking for all the uh dancing grouse the prairie chickens the sage grouse uh, we started out here at Red Rocks uh, the, the the famous ampl concert amphitheater is actually right behind me um you know it's a beautiful state beautiful time of year to be there you know things are thawing out uh, the rivers are flowing the dippers are coming back up from the lower canyons up to the high country um magnets are everywhere everybody's starting to uh to you know build nests get the spring cycle going uh mountain bluebirds were flooding in uh there was this stretch of this one valley we were in uh near gunnison it was just like it was just like just clouds of blue were were launching off the roadside the whole whole drive that afternoon it was pretty cool i'd never seen so many mountain bluebirds in my life uh, Lewis's woodpecker was a nice score there one afternoon. We uh, pulled in for this uh, lunch one day, uh, you know, stopped, to, you know, because we had a big, we actually had like three carloads of people. We we're doing this, this big trek. It's, it's, it's a drive intensive tour, but, you know, for, so we were just looking to stretch our legs after lunch before we were getting back into the car and, you know, they had, had, had a nice little Lewis's woodpecker pop up. Uh, water birds are starting to come in. Like the cinnamon teal and uh, Barrow's golden eye, uh, and rosy finches. We this was definitely this is the, uh, you know, it's kind of like the the added bonus of the chicken tour. I uh, try to get up into the high country and look for uh, like this is brown cap rosy finch, and then the other two can be seen, uh, gray crowns and uh, black rosy finches, which actually was one of my most overdue life birds. I was a, I was very very excited. I. Uh, when uh, when my co-leader called out that he had a black black rosy finch, everybody on the tour knew to just part to to you know least I run them over for that bird. <laughs> it was it was pretty exciting. 
Uh, Cassin's finch, they, they are a common bird up in the mountains of uh, Colorado. Um, and then, you know, so we worked our way up into the plains of Gunnison and Walden. Uh, this is the, the valley up in Walden, Colorado, uh, where we were out to look for sage grouse. Uh, um, these two photos actually were taken. This was day one. This was day two. We uh, The morning we were supposed to go to the sage grouse lek. Uh, we are woke up with our in, in total blackout. There, there had been this massive snowstorm and... Uh, you know, so we were we were in darkness, and the, the the hotel was was cold. It was a cold, windy day. So you know, we still got out, got to the sage grouse. They were they were doing their displays. It's a pretty wild display. You can see it's got a he's got these big inflatable sacks in its chest, and they 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 inflate them up uh, and just you know make this gurgling, bouncy thing. Uh, sound where they, they you know move these pouches up and down and shuffle around through the snow so they they did it for a little while um but it was so cold and windy that none of the uh the hens they were all hunkered down in this like big cluster of grouse off and they just despite the uh the male's best try they could not get the uh the lady grouse to come on out so the the luck kind of broke up early that day and uh and we fled for wyoming because there was no going back over the mountain pass <laughs> so um yes because we needed to get out into the grasslands of uh eastern colorado and uh, nebraska for for uh prairie birds like this uh, western meadowlark and uh we stopped at pawnee national grasslands and was able to pluck out this distant uh, mountain plover. Well, that was that was a fun score. I did not think we were going to see that bird, but but uh, came through in the 11th hour. Uh, Shark-tailed grouse were were pretty common in some sections of the Pawnee grasslands. Uh, we, we get several flocks of those. Um, and then we headed off into Nebraska for the prairie chickens. We uh, Went to a ranch, uh, the private ranch holder. Where he's been having. He's put up a, col a couple of old, uh, and I actually meant to put a picture of the the blind. He's got a couple of cattle carriers that he's put out on, in his fields where the the prairie uh, the prairie chickens dance, uh, where birders can go in and watch them do their thing at a close range. Uh, is a very very cool man. He's this this. Uh, He's been farming this uh, land for, gosh, about 65 years, and now he still has a few, you know, herds of cattle, but he is just so delighted to have birders come out and see the prairie chickens. He, he actually attended a talk he gave about prairie chickens, and it could have, you know, easily been a, a college course, you know, 110 prairie chicken ecology. So yes, we watched the the prairie chickens. They're they're really dynamic bird. They you know like the the sage grouse. They inflate that sack in the, the side of their chest to do some dancing and you know, pounding around with their feet across the ground. Uh, one will start up. A couple more will come over, and then sooner or later they are fighting. It is it is a really dynamic scene on a prairie chicken lek. They there's just they're hooting, they're cackling, they're they're making all kinds of wild noises, and then they'll start fighting and just just doing these flying drop kicks on each other. It was it was it was a good show. I uh, I recommend it. <laughs> so yeah, that was a lot of fun. <laughs> um, you know, there's a lot, always a lot of charismatic megafauna on that trip. We see a lot of elk, a lot of bighorn sheep, and uh, a lot of pronghorn antelope, which is just such such a pretty animal. I just I, I love their uh, supermodel eyelashes. Um, pretty, pretty animal. Um, so yeah, next up, next up. So yeah, no rest for the weary, right? So I did this uh, big driving tour. We ended up, I think we did like, I don't know, 2,100 miles of driving over two weeks to see all these grouse. Um, and then I flew straight to High Island, Texas, uh, which is like, you know, ground zero for migration. Uh, it, uh, this is, this is just like, this is the spot to go if you want to see lots of, uh, songbirds coming in over the bay, uh, the Gulf of Mexico, uh, what, you know, the dynamics here. So this is mid-May or mid-April at this point. Um, 
you have all these songbirds. They they're they're coming back up from South America, Central America. They congregate on the Yucatan Peninsula, and then you know most most songbirds are nocturnal migrants. And what they'll do is they'll launch off the Yucatan Peninsula and fly across the Gulf of Mexico. Um, you know, so it's, you know, it's kind of how, you know, you hear here in, you know, Michigan, where you get up the next morning and you go see what, you know, your favorite little migrant traps and see what's been, what flew in overnight. Except in Texas, it's interesting because the distance from the Yucatan to the upper Texas coast, yeah, uh, I'm sorry, I should have said High Islands up uh, just east of Houston, so it's pretty high up in Texas. Um, so it takes the birds actually quite some time to get there. Uh, the, all these birds that took off uh, from the Yucatan the night before, they don't tend to land, make landfall back till about, uh, you know, three, four o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, you can get some really good looks at these songbirds because, you know, they've been they've been flying for like 15 hours. They're, they're tired. They just want to comb through the bushes and, you know, refuel up. And often, like if you had like a, big land event, you know, one afternoon, chances are those birds are going to be around for a day or two before continuing on up north. Yes, we had lots of, uh, you know, tanagers, uh, lots of scissor-tailed flycatchers. That's just like the bird of the uh, fence posts out there. Uh, here's a nice summer tanager. Uh, so many summer tanagers. It was, it was ridiculous. It was wonderful. Uh, lots of indigo buntings. And we had lots of painted buntings. Uh, we we had a day where, gosh, I want to say I easily saw a hundred of these birds. It was incredible. <laughs> and uh, I I've always liked this species, but to to see them in those kinds of numbers, just just you know, like the, you get into this little field and they'll just be foraging on flowers, seed heads, and just just flashing all around. Uh, cool. Lots of Orioles. Uh, this is Baltimore Oriole, a lot of Orchard Orioles there too. Uh, hooded Warbler is a pretty common warbler there, uh, as is Kentucky Warbler. And, and uh, as, as is birds that eat the Kentucky Warblers. This is actually a Chuck Swills Widow, uh, a big uh, Muppet of a bird. Uh, they, uh, they're they about twice the size of, a, maybe not twice, but you know, a good third larger than a whippoorwill. And you can see that big flat head in it. Uh, you know, they're usually catch moths and other nocturnal uh, insects, but they, they actually have been discovered to uh, be quite the songbird predator during migrations. So that was that was a neat little, little fact, horrifying on some levels, but I'm, I'm fascinated by it. Um, wood thrush is another common bird, uh, a lot of yellow-billed cuckoos, you just, you know, you, you never know what's going to come migrating in off the Gulf of Mexico. You know, we even had this nice barn owl roosting in one of the little migrant traps there along the coast one morning. Uh, being Texas, you know, there's lots of uh, marshy swamps, you know, for water birds, like this purple gallinule. Um, flashy bird, I love these guys. Uh, King rails, and uh, it's also at this point the uh, the waders there uh, have started their breeding cycle. Uh, so you got the roseate spoonbills are all colored up, and then the egrets they get their breeding plumes. Um, one of my favorite spots that we go on the 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 migration tour here in Texas is uh, a you know High Island. There's a the Smith Woods uh, Rookery, uh, and it's just just full of great egrets and nesting snow egrets and tricolored herons and all kind, you know, tons of cormorants. It is it is noisy, it is smelly, but it looks like this, so it's all worth it. <laughs> um, <laughs> and you know, they've got some really nice uh, walkways, so you can just you know look at these birds doing their nesting cycles. And you know, these uh, these are the, the the breeding plumes that are only held for a short time with the uh, grits. And this is why uh, they they nearly went extinct, and the Audubon Society was created in Florida what about a century now to to protect these birds from being harvested from uh, for their plumes. Uh, reddish egret, that's uh, another bird down there that uh, pretty limited range in Texas and Mexico and Florida, and they, 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 they dress up pretty nice with their plumes. 
tons of shorebirds down there. It is just a, a fantastic spot to watch shorebirds migrate. You know, this is a Hudsonian god, but you have like two forms of shorebirding down there, you know, out in the uh, the mud flats along the, the ocean, or there's a lot of rice fields near High Island, and that'll have a lot of uh, dowichers, yellow legs, godwits, and you just sort of drive around in the afternoons looking to see where the, the flocks of godwits and dowichers are. Um, here's a willet. This is the eastern willet. This is that one that I told you migrates out of uh, out of the states down to South America. Uh, endangered Wilson's plover. It's even got a little band on it, and a lot of terns there too. You know, being on the the coast of uh, Gulf of Mexico in May, just lots of lease terns and sandwich terns. Uh, just just really nice times. Uh, you really have to tear ourselves away to uh, get out to the Trans-Pecos and uh, the Edwards Plateau of uh, Central West Texas as uh, the Rio Grande, Val uh, Rio Grande River up in Del Rio. Uh, we went to uh, the, the, bat the Rio Frio Bat Cave. This is, this is an incredible spot. I, I have friends who have just traveled the world and they say this is one of the great spectacles on the planet for what they've seen that at dusk at the the Rio Frio Bat Cave uh 10 to 12 million Mexican free-tailed bats come just blasting out of that cave you know we showed up about an hour before sunset and they started coming out of that cave and they were still going strong when it got to be too dark to see them anymore um really just 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 kind of mind bending uh, also in those caves are cave swallows. This is a, a Mexican bird that's uh, really kind of colonized uh, Texas and come up and they, they, they nest in the bat caves. Um, and also uh, there in the, the bat cave are these uh, family groups of Harris hawks, which uh, will just, just fly right through these flocks of bats and just snagging them every night. You know, they, and they're, uh, they're an interesting pack hunter where it's one of the few raptors we know of that does cooperative hunting. Although with, with the bat flock, I mean, you got 12 million bats in there. All you gotta do is just fly through the, the tornado of bats and just close your talons and you, you got dinner. Um, so the, the big draw why we went out to the, the Edwards Plateau is the uh, federally endangered uh, golden-cheeked warbler. Uh, they only nest in the juniper hillsides of central Texas. They uh, uh, just gorgeous bird, kind of like our black-throated green warblers, but uh, really range restricted, you know, just on the Edwards Plateau where, where they nest and then down to Guatemala for the winter. Um, I love the Edwards Plateau. It's such an interesting blend of Eastern birds, Mexican birds, and birds of the deserts. <clears throat> um, a lot of, you know, you've got some uh, yellow-breasted chats. Just it's a very birdy place, and uh, definitely like you, you think, you know, you think it's not going to get any better than the migrant traps on the coast. But then you get out there to uh, Lost Maples State Natural Area, and it's just it's well worth the drive. Uh, Yellow-throated vireo and uh, green kingfisher, long-billed uh, thrasher is another one of these Mexican birds, just barely over the border, and uh, tropical perula. This is this is one that just only nests in a, a handful of river drainages in the U.S. You know, much more common south of the border. Um, I was pretty pleased to have this this guy just bop right down right in front of the tour group. I. You know, normally I don't try to, uh, my, my goal is to get people on the birds, not take photos. This was the, one of the only times all year long that I'm just, just snapping photos going, just look where my camera is. Because <laughs> it was like right in front of our face. I, I could not believe it. I've never, I've never been so close to one. Um, yeah, so uh, keep, you know, I can always on the move though. You know, we, so we finished up the Texas tour and I, Headed out to California, out to uh, the LA region. Um, I had a couple days off between tours, so I spent a lot of time just sitting on the, the cliffs, looking at the ocean, uh, you know, watching all the seabirds migrating north, black oyster catchers, elegant terns, uh, flocks of brants were going by. 
you know, there are Pacific loons out there way out over the ocean moving north. Sometimes, you know, like, you know, big flocks, you know, you can sometimes see these birds by the, the, the tens of thousands on a really good day. It's a, a pretty, pretty impressive movements. Uh, big flocks of surf scoters going by those cliffs. Um, so one of the things that surprised me the most about LA was the San Gabriel Mountains are right above Pasadena. And, you know, you can get up into these beautiful wilderness mountains and, you know, you're still looking down onto the LA Valley and it's just like, you're looking at all these hundreds of thousands of people and then you're up on this little cliff and you're like, wow, it's just, just me and the white-headed woodpeckers. And it just sort of blows my mind that you can be so close to a major population center and still have such amazing wilderness. Um, this, is a, this is a handsome bird. I tend not, not go see one of these when I'm out traveling around and I'm in their range, a very limited range uh, in Western North America. Uh, a lot of Stellar's Jays up there, up there the, the Jeffreys and Colt Hare Pines. Uh, and mountain quail. This was this, you know, this is this is the hard bird to find. I was pretty pleased to, to have this one kind of scurry by one day. Uh, a lot of warblers are migrating through, hermit warbler and uh, the Wilson's warblers. A lot of band-tailed pigeons always just kind of, you know, you always hear this bird before you see it. You just hear that the flapping of the wings and they just go racing by like 30 miles an hour over your head. Uh, so, but what had brought me to LA is I had my next tour set up was uh, we're taking a cruise ship uh, from LA to uh, Vancouver, uh, British Columbia. Uh, you know, over the last decade, uh, birders have kind of figured out that these cruise ships are an incredible way to see uh, deep sea uh, tube noses, albatrosses, petrels. And that you can actually, because, uh, you know, the cruise ships are so large, you can, you know, it's a stable platform and you can use telescopes, uh, you know, and just be able to see sights that you, you know, you otherwise wouldn't in a, a small boat due to the distances that uh, the big cruise ships go out from land. Uh, here's, yeah, here's a shot of uh, as us sailing underneath the Golden Gate Bridge we put into port there one night on our way up to Vancouver. Um, but yeah, the, 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 the seabirds were pretty cool. Uh, bear with me, I got a couple of lousy photos because they were, it was the, the best photo ops. We saw lots of black vented shearwaters, uh, just, you know, tens of thousands of sooty shearwaters were flying by. Um, a lot of black footed albatrosses. Uh, and two of the species that we were really just hunting for were Murphy's petrel. Uh, that's this blurry little gray thing. Uh, it actually was pretty incredible. Uh, you know, people, this is the reason why people sign up on this tour is for this and the Hawaiian petrels. And uh, normally, if you're lucky, you get like a half a dozen, dozen Murphy's petrels. This year, we we had like 150 of these. It was it was pretty cool. It was unprecedented. Um, you know, some some happy happy birders. You know, we had uh, here's a Hawaiian petrel that uh, whipped by us one day. Uh, as we got further north, uh, you know, some of the bird life changed over a little bit. We started getting into these big flocks of red phalaropes, and they would just launch. You know, the 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 boat would basically kick them up right. You know, just cleave these blocks of hundreds of red fallow ropes up off the water. Um, we started getting fulmars when we got up into Oregon waters. Uh, they're, they're a pretty cool uh, relative of sheer waters and petrels. And then as we sailed into the Vancouver Harbor, uh, the, uh, the sound there, uh, we started hitting some nice flocks of the, these rhinoceros auklets, which is you know, relative of the puffin, just such a such a wild bird. Um, you know, like the puffins, they actually that that bill sheath they'll they'll shed it in the winter. But uh, yeah, they've got these you know weird horny plate roasts that they they grow on their their bills that you're seeing here for uh, breeding season. Um, yeah, so you know, just just still trucking along though, right back down to Arizona. Um, I need to speed this up and talking too much. We've got a lot to go. Uh, is, so at this point, we're in May in Arizona. This is a, a really amazing time for uh, songbirds to be migrating through. Uh, some real rarities like this tufted flycatcher. 
And the uh, first, our second U.S. record of pine flycatcher, which uh, was a just a real treat. Uh, I was actually, you know, life bird for every last single person on my tour, including myself. So that was it was a lot of fun to get a a twelve way lifer that day. Uh, the you know the the mountain sides were just full of these black headed grosbeaks and western tanagers and uh, lots of Columbia vireos. Uh, but yeah, the, the point of my, my May Arizona tour is it is the warbler and owl tour. So this is this is the breeding cycle for, for warblers and uh, owls then. Lots of painted red starts. I, uh, they're just a very common bird when you get up into the canyons. I, I like to say, uh, you know, happiness is measured in the amount of painted red starts one sees in a day and um i'm always very happy when i'm in these canyons because they're 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 a pretty common bird um lots of grace's warblers uh the little lucy's warbler the uh, uh this and the prothonotary the only ones actually nest in cavities in, in north america for warblers all others build a a cup nest up either in the tree or on the ground a uh, red-faced warbler, which is just a stunning bird out of Mexico, and the uh, olive warbler, which is actually not a warbler at all, but just a, a great moment in convergent evolution of some monotypic uh, family of birds that have just evolved to fill in that warbler niche. Uh, and we did well for owls. We, we had we had eight species of owls. We got some really really great looks at owls on this trip. I was I was really pleased. I I normally sort of dread trying to show people owls. They're just such a hard bird to 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 hedge your bets on. But uh, this really worked out. We had you know great horned. We had uh, lots of burrowing owls up north of Tucson. Uh, we had uh, a couple different encounters with uh, northern pygmy owl. This is a tiny little fierce bird predator, the slayer of tip mice and juncos. Um, and yeah, it was, it was really, yeah, I really enjoyed that bird. <laughs> uh, whiskered screech owl, this whiskered screech owl up in the uh, Pine Oak Canyons of uh, the Chiricahuas. And we had uh, a family, a, a pair of spotted owls. Uh, on a nest uh, up in the Chiricahua Mountains, which was uh, pre pretty exciting considering they're, they're getting pretty rare, really a declining species. Um, so yeah, so it's uh, it's written into my, uh, my contract with my tour companies that mid-May is my time, that uh, I don't, you know, I finished up this tour and raced back to the Upper Peninsula because, you know, it's, it's this, is, this, is the this is the reason why I moved to Marquette, to be in the UP. This is up from Brockway Mountain, a bald eagle going by Brockway. And, you know, this is when the uh, Eastern Warblers start really hitting our woods. Uh, the uh, the uh, Myrtle Warbler here and uh, Magnolia Warbler, these are a mix of pictures from... Uh, from uh, Copper Harbor and Peninsula Point, actually. Uh, Bay-breasted warbler, uh, black Burnian warbler, which is just one of my favorites. Uh, I think that's number three, I said that. Uh, Chestnut-sided warbler. And uh, here is the Connecticut warbler from the La Las Peninsula Point. when this when this guy finally popped out and it was a very exciting moment and if I remember correctly I think it was a lifer for Kathy and she was very very happy uh as was I because it's just it's a fun bird to see you know and I God, we're at a point where I think we've had them more years than not on the, the the Peninsula Point picnics so I'll see everybody there next May um and then back back to work, uh, headed right out uh, after the Peninsula Point picnic to uh, the East Coast. Uh, this is the Stormy Petrel. This is a boat run by my friends Brian Pattison and uh, Kate Sutherland. Uh, they've really spent the last 20 plus 30 years now running seabird tours uh, into the uh, Gulf Stream. Uh, coming up out of the Gulf of Mexico, up along the North American continent, um, and you, we go to we do this in North Carolina because uh, it's one of the few spots that the Gulf Stream comes close enough to the continental shelf to allow for day trips. This is a, you know it's a, this was probably about a forty foot boat, 
And we had it on out for uh, a couple of days of searching that blue warm tropical water for uh, tube noses. Um, you know, right out the gate, we start seeing lots of little Wilson storm petrels pattering around. Uh, you, a lot of common and Arctic terns flying once you get out to deeper water. It's when you start getting uh, some of the shear waters, uh, the great shear water and quarry shear waters are actually very, very common. Sometimes we see these birds by the hundreds out there. Um, my friend Kate, uh, she does an amazing job of uh, chumming these birds in. She's got all this uh, you know, frozen blocks of suet and fish oil, and she puts them in these cages, and we just drag them behind the boat for a little ways, trying to attract the uh, the tube noses. They have incredible sense of smell, and so after a little while, that that smell of melting fish suet starts to uh, hit the ocean currents and then just, you know, these seabirds, they just start drifting in and you're, you're always hoping that these flocks of shearwaters will bring in some cool birds like these uh, small little band rump storm petrels, which is a pretty deep ocean species. Uh, black cap petrel, this is just one of these masters of air and wind. They, they, I see them flap their wings sometimes, but usually they're just gliding along. A really cool bird. Uh, this is a Trinidadje petrel. This is a, this is a really rare one. This is a, a lifer for a lot of people on the tour that day. Uh, I'd only seen it a, a two or three times before, so I was I was pretty excited about that. Um, and uh, at one point, we even had a pair of the uh, South Polar skuas come right in to check us out. I mean, this is. You know, you, you may have heard of Jaegers, you know, those relatives of gulls and terns who uh, try to chase down gulls to, to get them to give up their food. Uh, but skuas, I mean, this is a red-tailed hawk-sized bird. And, you know, it just, it just comes flying into these flocks of shearwaters and just, just knocks them right into the water to try to get the... Uh, the the scraps of food that the shear water is snagged and uh they they're they're a bruiser it's a it's a cool bird um i was i was pretty blown away to have have this pair come flying right over the boat normally they just sort of come in and then keep on going but these guys stayed with us for a while um the other thing we do on the uh the carolina tour is we go into the piney woods uh you know i never thought i'd fall so in love with North Carolina, but but I have it. Uh, it is an amazing state, full of some really cool areas. They've got this uh, really interesting bog pine habitat that you think would be more, uh, you know, more at place in the Upper Peninsula than it would be in the Carolinas. But you know, it's some pretty expensive tracts of uh, pine, savanna, and swamp, and this is where the uh, red cockaded woodpeckers uh, nest, which is kind of the uh, the main target for when we're in these pine winds. It's a, a critically endangered species. You know, their range has really been reduced uh, from, you know, logging and uh, habitat uh, loss due to development. Um, but we always do really well for them. This, uh, and this was a, we, we, uh, it was a bird actually coming into its nest. We were just kind of walking along and it just, flew in with a big mouthful of grubs right over our heads and that uh that was that was a that was a lucky find we, you know, my people really enjoyed this um lots of other cool birds in these pinelands and swamps brown-headed nuthatch which uh sounds like a little dog squeaky toy it's a you know get into these big family groups of a dozen or more just squeaking their way through the pines um, lots of uh, prothonotary warblers. I just saying dozens and dozens and dozens of them. They just they're just everywhere. If there's a little bit of damp and wet canals around, they'll be nesting there. Uh, yep, lots of yellow-throated warblers and just just prairie warblers everywhere. They just have this amazing, weird, psychedelic-sounding song. It's uh, you know, just sort of like the aliens beaming you up from uh, from Earth. Uh, and Swainson's warbler is another another big target that a lot of people are trying to uh, come to these swampy uh, forests to uh, find. And we usually do pretty good for getting some some looks at this bird that tends to stay really buried deep in the uh, underbrush. Um, so yeah, so that uh, you know that was my my spring run of tours, and uh, but then it was time for my own vacation where. Uh, 
Um, this photo, this photo was taken at 1.30 in the morning, which means I have gone to Alaska. <laughs> so it was, uh, took, took a break, took a, uh, headed out up to uh, Alaska with my buddy, Louis Dombrowski. Some of you know him as the, uh, 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 a, on and off again, LAWAS member, and he's currently living in Arizona, running the Patent Center for Hummingbirds. And uh, we flew into Alaska in mid-June and headed straight to Nome, uh, which is just about one of the coolest places I've ever gone to. I, uh, you know, I was kind of, there were some birds up there I wanted to see, so I figured like, oh, you know, I'm going to, you know, be nice to scratch this off the bucket list and then, you know, move on with my life. And I don't know, I was probably there for about four or five hours before I realized like Nome would be a place that I'm going to be going back to over and over again because it was just, it was special. Um, just long-tailed Jaegers everywhere, just, just flying across the tundra, just breeding pairs of them everywhere. I, I was really, I knew that was going to be a thing, but I wasn't quite expected for the reality of the visual of, of pairs of long-tailed Jaegers just sitting on stop signs and just just on the sides of the roads. Uh, Arctic terns, just about the most common bird up there in Nome. They uh, <laughs> they sit on telephone wires like they're morning doves. I, I wasn't expecting that. Uh, lots of uh, water birds making their homes in Nome. This is a red-throated loon, a lot of red-throated and Pacific loons. Uh, Harlequin ducks are just all over the place along the, the rocky shorelines. Uh, Glock skull is just, you know, just always kind of rolling in and out of the fog there on the Bering Sea. Um, here's, a, here's another 3 a.m. birding shot. This is a pair of tundra swans. I always just so enjoyed the 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 not the, the, the never-ending light to go bird watching in. I mean, we, you know, I think it was like day three or four where I'm just like, I turned to Louie. I'm like, I think we have the sun mania. <laughs> it's like, we'd sleep a couple hours late in the, late in the day and then get back up and start doing it again. Uh, you know, the bird diversity isn't huge in Nome, but it's a, uh, it, what's there is pretty amazing. Like this uh, Lapland long spur, uh, you know, you're driving along these roads and you have these red-throated loons basically nesting in these tiny little road puddles. You know, you just have these little marshy holes that uh, have red-throated loons and uh, red-necked phalarope. You know, these birds are known for like, you know, spinning around to uh, create a vortex to suck up the uh, food particles from further down in the pond. You can see it's got the, or, you know, trying to get that vortex going. Uh, and then we took some time to drive up off the coast into just the the the, the tundra. It just it was it was just a scene out of the the Pleistocene. You know, I was I I loved it. It was you know full of flowers and rocks and willow ptarmigans and rock ptarmigans. Uh, I was really impressed with the flowers of the tundra. I was not expecting to see so many blooms. Uh, here's a northern weed ear. Uh, near its nest, uh, that's a dwarf fireweed it's by. It's, uh, I guess it's the same genus as the fireweed we have up in the uh, Upper Peninsula, but uh, it was already at full bloom in June and uh, just uh, just two, three inches tall at most. And this is the bird I, uh, I wanted to see the most in Nome. This is why I went up there, was the blue throat. This is uh, a species more common in Europe and Asia. Uh, but there's just a little breeding population of them in Alaska, and uh, this 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 one brought me to tears. I was I wanted to see this, and it 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 blew my mind. Uh, it it uh, it's a mimic. It was making all kinds. It was imitating red poles. It was imitating semi palmated sandpipers. Uh, some Jaegers flew by, making this barking call, and it started incorporating that into their song. And their actual song just this bubbly, rollicking sound. And uh, this this bird was just very cooperative. I just I don't know, spent about an hour or so watching this bird before he finally headed off. It was definitely definitely the high point of my summer. Uh, as was seen, muskox. I <laughs> I went for the blue throats, and I stayed for the muskox. They they are. They are quite the beast and find little bits of their wool all over the tundra. You just, you know, you see a willow bush and you can, you know, just be strands of that fine wool hanging off the bush. 
Uh, we then uh, headed down to Seward, where we took this uh, great little small boat trip up and through the fjords um, to go see all the nesting uh, water birds up there. Uh, lots of kitty wakes, um, lots of thick billed mirrors and common mirrors up there. These are thick builds. Uh, horn puffins were all over the place. That was that was a fun bird to see, as were tufted puffins. Uh, parakeet auklets, and then we went into this one uh, uh, glacier bay, and uh, you can see the, the harbor seal sitting there in the ice flow, and we were here for a very special species that only forages at the uh, the melt melting glacier, uh, Kitlitz's merlet. is a very specialized bird, obviously one that is really going to be in trouble if climate change speeds up. Uh, because they, they need those that, that melting glacier water to, to feed and forage in. Um, lots of uh, cool sea animals there, like the sea otter, and then also my uh, these, these orcas, which was actually a new beast for me, despite having done a lot of whale surveys for NOAA. I had never seen orca before, so that was, that was a thrill. Um, so yeah, headed home to the UP for, for a little break, you know, spent a lot of time in my gardens, but uh, made sure to see Kirtland's warblers. We're, you know, we're pretty lucky to have these guys nesting down by the airport in Gwynn. Um, but it was, it was all too short at home and I was back to Arizona for the monsoons. And this is, this is the other great time to go to Arizona when the, uh, when the uh, the warm air comes off the Pacific Ocean and uh, really starts up the rains of Arizona, and like this so this July August, and I just I couldn't believe it. I didn't didn't know Arizona could get so green. You know, just flowers. Everything was in flower. The, the birds were just you know they really respond to this. And Casson's kingbird up in a blooming agave here. Uh, a lot of birds actually in Arizona, they, you know, this is the time of year they call the second spring because, you know, this is when things are blooming. A lot of birds delay their breeding cycles to late summer to take advantage of all the food resources. Uh, the scaled quail are running all over with their babies. You know, the sparrows, uh, like this Casson sparrow and this five-striped sparrow, they, they don't even start singing till late July, early August as does the very bunting you know i i don't see this bird at all in the uh the, all of my other tours this is this is a monsoon season specialty uh violet crown hummingbirds are still there because they are busy raising little cups of uh baby violet crown hummingbirds uh august is also that is the hummingbird season to go to that's the time to go to arizona uh lots of hummingbirds there i think we got about 13 species of hummingbird on this tour in August, this last August. Uh, Broad-billed hummingbird, uh, magnificent hummingbird, blue-throated mountain gem, white-eared hummingbird, and here's a barrel hummingbird coming into uh, an agave here. I uh, I love the, the monsoon season because it's pretty cool for uh, snakes and lizards and other cool herps. I spent a lot of time driving around at night. This is twin spotted rattlesnake, a real specialty animal of those Arizona mountains. Really restricted range for these guys. And then when you're driving around at night looking for snakes, you find cool things like this poor will. Um, and, you know, because, you know, and everyone, I know what you guys are thinking, you're thinking, August, Arizona, no thank you. Um, but, you know, it's, it's interesting because the, the rains really do cool the area off. And we also spend a bit of time up in these uh, mountain canyons, which are, you know, really lush this time of year. Uh, just, just full of birds, uh, acorn woodpeckers, zone-tailed hawks, hepatic tanagers just get, uh, you know, family groups of these hepatic tanagers just roaming up and down these oak, oak canyons. Uh, greater Peewee, uh, the Jose Maria bird, that's their, their song, they're just sitting up on a pine tree singing Jose Maria, um, a Scots Oriole, uh, and uh, we went back to that spot where I had the uh, spotted owl pair nesting in the spring, and this is their little baby, although not so little anymore. You can see it's starting to replace its downy feathers with its adult you know, got the little spotted vest now that that vest will fill in as it gets older. 
Uh, and then, of course, the, the bird that everyone goes to Arizona for, trogons. Uh, here's a trogon actually right over its nest hole. They uh, they really like these sycamore canyons. Uh, they're they're cavity nesters. Uh, but they don't they don't have any ability to dig their own cavities, so they like sycamores because there's it tends to be a lot of natural openings in a sycamore. And this guy was feeding his little youngster. Um, it was it was pretty cool to see. I had never I'd never had seen a baby trogan uh, so well before. And we actually ran into several family groups while we were there. Um, very cooperative. You uh, it, <laughs> oh the 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 noises. That that the happy tour participants made after we spent uh, spent some time with this Papa Trogan and his baby. It was it was it was a good afternoon. Uh, definitely uh, definitely the, uh, the the wine flowed at dinner that night. <laughs> um, so wrap that up. You know, I headed back home. This is Presque Isle. This is this is my. My, my one of my other favorite times of year to be at home is uh, August, September. You know, it's just it's you know as you guys know, it's just like it's it's fall in the morning and summer in the afternoons. You know, birds are starting to move. Lots of shorebirds, these semi-palmated sandpipers, uh, semi-palmated plover here, and here's the uh, buff-breasted sandpiper that I think a lot of us got to see that was hanging out at the Dead River Mouth this uh, this September, this last September. Um, but yeah, it's hard for me to even leave the yard this time of year. I got my bird baths going, uh, everything's in bloom. I, you know, the birds are coming to me. Lots of uh, Nashville and Tennessee warblers. Uh, this fall was really interesting because there was uh, there were a lot of eruptive birds moving in the UP. There was a big, big, huge movement of nut hatches this fall. First red breasted early in the fall and later white breasted moved through in October and November. Um, warblers start moving through by Labor Day. Um, not as pretty in the spring. Um, if anything, downright confusing. This is a, a young morning warbler. Um, and here is a magnolia warbler, a little more recognizable. Uh, big numbers of thrushes come through uh, around the, you know, I'd say for, for us in Marquette, like, you know, that last week of August through the first two weeks of, of September are the time to, uh, I mean, I'm at Presque Isle every morning because, you know, you can have just dozens of Swainson's thrushes, lots of uh, great cheek thrushes. And, uh, <clears throat> and in the last few years, we've uh, been cluing in down to Delta County that there is this massive, massive broadwing hawk migration going on on the Stonington and Gladstone area. And we keep, you know, it's been kind of this like under the radar thing because there's no like one great watch spot. Like, you know, if you want to go watch hawks, you go to Whitefish Point in the spring because they're they're close. But the uh, the numbers that are moving through Little Bay Danak, uh, me and Joe McDonald were down there. I think this was like September 19th of this last fall. We had 15,000 broadwing hawks go over us in five hours that day. And this is a, this is the fifth time in the last three years we've had had over 10,000 broadwing hawks go by. It's 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 pretty amazing stuff. It's uh, definitely a population level migration going on that nobody knows about. And I keep I keep thinking we 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 got to start a count, like a more formal count down there. Uh, just. Yeah, real, real, real cool birds. You know, problem is like they so rarely come in. Like this, I actually shot this bird as it was coming in low late in the day, come back into roost. Uh, it, it had gotten through too late. Uh, fall hawk watch running, you know, tend to be high. You know, I mean, he's just little pepper specks up in the sky. Um, so speaking of big numbers of birds, I had one last run of tours for the fall um, out at Cape May Bird Observatory, which is just like the, the capital city of bird watching. This is, this is the place. I uh, worked here for a few years as the water bird counter at the bird observatory there. Um, and I've been going back every fall to, to lead tours. It's, uh, you know, I mean, all, all the, the field guides you have on your shelves right now, the, the, the folks who Wrote, write these field guides. This is where they live by and large. Uh, most, you know, Sibley lived there. Uh, Crosley was living there for a long time. John Dunn just is, uh, you know, it's a very, very birdie place and uh, definitely something that should be on everybody's bucket list. So this is about uh, 10,000 
tree swallows foraging in front of the uh, Cape May Lighthouse is a pretty pretty common occurrence there, actually. Um, lots of uh, black scoters and surf scoters migrating by at the Avalon Sea Watch. That's uh, I, I always called the the Avalon Sea Watch. That was that was my grad school. Um, flocks of black skimmers. Lots of uh, Forster's turns going by. Uh, ospreys are nonstop. It's just, just sometimes you can see a hundred ospreys migrating by up there. Um, and the the delightful thing about ospreys, they will sometimes migrate by with you know having packed a lunch. Like he was not this bird was in migration. It wasn't just going to go feed on this fish. It was coming down the coastline and kept on going till it was out of sight with this fish. And it was like when it was done flying, it knew it would have food. It's amazing. Uh, lots of uh, birds out in the salt marshes. Here's a uh, here's a fun ID slide. Uh, black young young night herons here. Black crowned night heron on the right. Yellow crowned night heron on the left. Uh, you know the black crowns are the youngsters. They're a bit more brown. That's a lot more coarse streaking. And then the yellow crown on the left. It's a lot more of a gray tone. Those dark wings and the the streaking's really fine. Just a really interesting comparison shot a uh, shot of two similar birds. Um, and the songbirds are amazing there too. Like, uh, yeah, I, I love I love the way I have my schedules. Like, come home to the UP for a little bit of fall migration, and then head down to tour Cape May because the birds have left the UP and now they're now they're halfway down the continent. Uh, you know, you get days with a thousand flickers migrating by. Uh, the the songbirds that they'll they'll come by just you know sometimes in the tens of thousands just warbler flocks and they have these young hot shots there at these count sites standing up on the tower counting hundreds if not thousands of warblers in just a few hours uh, in the morning it just it, you know I, uh, I I miss those days of being able to be do, doing things like that but my my eyes have melted from counting too many ducks. Uh, thankfully, for people who aren't used to counting hundreds and hundreds of warblers in flight, they do they do eventually sit down and, uh, like all migrants, tend to be kind of tired and just more interested in foraging. Uh, here's another perula, uh, black-throated green warbler. And of course, you cannot go to Cape May without seeing a Cape May warbler, uh, and definitely one of the... The, the the quintessential birds of that tour, lots of Cape May, you know, pretty common bird too. We never never miss seeing that guy. Uh, lots of shorebirds. Here's a big flock of dowagers and navisets. Um, we one day we spend actually we get on a small boat and start going into the salt marshes, the back bays of uh, Cape May, uh, to look at shorebirds and other salt marsh specialties. Here's uh, some American oyster catchers. Uh, of course, we all know like the Delaware Bay, New Jersey region is famous for uh, red knots. This is a red knot, uh, definitely an integral breeding or uh, foraging spot for red knots heading up north and back south. Uh, we get into the, the the Spartina grass marshes where there's this wimbrel and where we're really what we're doing is looking for uh, marsh sparrows like the seaside sparrow and salt marsh sparrows and Nelson sparrows. And, uh, you know, I, we were, you know, I was out with my group one, one evening and we had this bird uh, pop up and, you know, first I'm going like, oh, cool, we got a Nelson Sparrow and, you know, we're photographing it, looking at it. I'm like, actually, on second thought, I think it's a Nelson Sparrow. And, you know, then we're doing, you know, it wasn't, you know, it took some more shots and bird flew back into the marsh and we headed off to dinner and we're doing our evening checklist. And I was just like, we got to hold off on what we're going to call this bird. Because uh, I wanted to, you know, I was starting to get really confused because it had field marks of both salt marsh and Nelson's sparrow. And uh, as it turns out, this is this is actually these these are all markers for a hybrid of the two species, which has actually very rarely been photographed. So that was this is uh, definitely my my big bird of the fall. I was I was pretty thrilled to to see and find and photograph this bird and and uh, not just uh, blow it off because it's just such a subtle subtle creature. Um, 
Yeah, and the thing that made Cape May so famous is it's it's a, it's a dynamic hawk spot. Uh, you know, you don't you don't get the big flocks of broadwings the way we do in the UP at Cape May. But what it's great for are the sipiters and the falcons, the ones that tend to fly along coastlines. And here you get some really great eye level looks of these birds just zipping along the uh, the, the dunes here. This is a sharp shin hawk. This is Cooper's hawk. Uh, Peregrine falcon. Cape May is the peregrine falcon capital of the, the world. Sometimes uh, you, know, you get a couple hundred of them zipping by in the afternoon. And merlins, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of merlins. I mean, all those warblers up in the air and the, the merlins, uh, you know, they, they've, got, they've got forage. They just, they follow those warbler flocks down. Um, okay. Uh, hey, Jeff, I'm, I'm going over, aren't I? <laughs> Well, um, I, I'm loath to to interrupt this guy because uh, right amazing presentation. Uh, the the library is letting us know we're going to turn into a pumpkin here in about ten minutes. Uh, so we need a few minutes, you know. Just okay, well I can. Yeah. So sure. Well, I got just a few more to go. I'll just sort of flip through them real fast and uh, forget the the storytelling here because we're we're almost to the end. Okay, sounds so, good. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, anyway, so uh, you know, at this point, you know, I'd really racked up a pretty pretty amazing year of birds and was just kept you know ready to just try to finish strong. Came home to the UP, you know, got Harris sparrows and rusty blackbirds. Uh, some of us, you know, traveled over from Marquette to St. Ignace for this uh, chaffinch from Europe. And then uh, an NMU student found this uh, sagebrush sparrow up at uh, Wetmore Landing, which uh, is only like the third record east of the Great Plains. Uh, you know, spent uh, kind of spent the rest of my fall at Peninsula Point looking at, you know, widgeons and gadwalls and ringneck ducks migrating by. Um, big numbers of blue jays were moving in October and November this year, as were chickadees. It was just a huge chickadee eruption fall. Uh, you just gave, we had these clouds of chickadees flying out over Lake Michigan, trying to move south. I uh, had some boreal chickadees moving with them. Uh, had this goshawk come, or goshawks on the move this fall. So what goes down must come back up. So I'll be looking for them in the spring. And uh, yeah, and then, uh, you know, things, you know, birds were pretty much wrapping up in the Upper Peninsula. You know, the gulls were moving in. This is beautiful Iceland gull. And I was thinking that, that my next step would be to head off to, uh, uh, Massachusetts to uh, go see seabirds out there in the late fall. And that's when I discovered I needed meniscus surgery. And that was that. My big year came crashing to an end. Uh, my very last bird, I took a walk up at Little Presque Isle and found this little sawwet owl. And that was my last bird of the year before I had surgery the, the next day. So, you know, it, uh, Usually, usually big years for me, it's like they start out slow and end strong, and it was the exact opposite this year. So it was uh, it was a pretty good year, though, full of, full of birds, full of a lot of happy people. I was really pleased to be able to show so many cool things to, to other birders. So I'm um, sorry to keep you guys going so long. I got there off in the weeds there a couple of times, and... Uh, um, I don't know if they've got a second for a question. I'll be happy to take questions. And if not, uh, thanks for sticking with me. I see the, the online participants have actually done a pretty good job of staying on. So thank you. Thank you, Sky. Uh, you certainly covered a lot of territory uh, and racked up a lot of birds uh, and mammals and reptiles in, in uh, 2022. So um, I, I I told everybody at the mm -hmm. start that you're gonna be blown yeah, up yeah, by was... guys, photography and knowledge of birds. And uh, and I hope uh, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. That was fantastic. Thank you, thank you. <clears throat> we'll probably have uh, maybe a minute or so for a question or two. And let me... Oh. Oh. They're kicking us out. So, Sky, uh, we're looking forward to having you back here in the UP. And again, thank you very much for a great presentation. Ah, thank you, Jeff. Thanks. Take care, everyone. Go on. Thank you.
Thanks. Hey, you. <laughs> What was the species count, Sky? What was the species oh, count? Yeah, yeah, that's right. The biggest part, uh, 636. Because <laughs> oh, it's not about the number. It's about the No, adventure. it's not. No, it is not. <laughs> that's right. Here I am talking about a big year. What was the number? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Great job, though. Excellent Thanks, work. Bud.